Welcome back, everyone, and let's play where the water tastes like wine. You're here with Grand Lafitte, otherwise known as Drax Craven, when we're going to, you know, do the same thing we've been doing for the past Stacks videos. of suitcases grind the parked Model A deeper into the dirt. An extended family inside defies the carrying capacity of the vehicle. The driver leans out the window. Want this? He swings a violin around by its neck. Ten bits. We need it for gas. You hear a muffled pounding from somewhere within the car. Sorry, sir, I ain't got that much. Six bits, then. We need it for gas. The pounding becomes frantic. All right, I'll buy it. The violin is yours, and the car shudders down the road. It's not quite out of sight when the back door pops open and you hear a girl's voice scream at you. That violin belongs to Louise Ames, you dumb fuck. The door and the girl are wrestled back into place, and the car fades into the blur of the horizon. I guess I'll keep the violin in case I should run into her again. Its weight feels like a comfort as you walk. After all, who knows when you'll need Louise Ames' violin. <laughs> 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 you dumb fuck. Oh, that's delightful. Alright, let's head into Detroit. Uh, I have lost all my cash to do that. Let's earn some quick cash. Uh, let's look for some work. Hospital needs someone to mop the floors for the day. Nurse gives you instructions. Rat tat tat. Scrub surgery A and floor 2. Skip the rooms with the newborns. Ask Dr. Penny if he wants his office done. This is very important. to Get these hallways done before lunch. Uh, you got it. You try to remember all the nurse's very important instructions, but it's impossible. You haven't seen her in hours. The place is busy as hell and nobody's watching you. Uh, mop floors are random. You mop random rooms and hallways as fast as you can. Totally at random. Around lunch, someone in a suit waves you down and hands you a plate of lunch. At about three, a nurse gives you an ice cream cone. Sick kids wave at you. A doctor? Baby? Shakes your hand? What's going on? When the nurse tracks you down at the end of the day, she's beaming. You did a wonderful job. Everyone was so impressed. This place has never been so clean. You keep your... Secret method to yourself. <laughs> Let's explore. The rain is coming down so hard. It's a wonder the sidewalk hasn't started to crack. You manage to find a narrow patch under a ledge where you can stay dry. Oh, it's time for a Wheel of Fortune story. We weed out the rain. A squat man bundled up in a black fur coat and matching hat approaches. The thick rain flattens and mats his fur. He squints up at you. You're in my spot. He crows. Very well then. I'll give it up. He thanks you as you step aside back into the rain. You keep walking, hoping to find more shelter. Glance back, just once. Now that you see the man from a distance, you're not sure the fur is a coat. A pair of red eyes shine back at you. I'm just gonna keep walking. The rain stops a minute later. You look back up the road, but the squat man is gone. Did I run into a rat man? The red creature in the fur coat. What do they got in the store here? Coney dogs, scrambled eggs, coffee and a sandwich. Nah, I'm good, but thanks a bunch, anyway. All right, westward we go. What do we have here? The car is a lifeline. Oh my. Your one hope to escape the encroaching storm. It rattles along a few yards ahead of the storm front, jouncing and juddering. One pothole away from being swallowed by the choking dust. A figure clings to support straps mounted on the back. Catch a ride! I had to. You grab the straps and haul yourself up. Oh! Shouts the woman on the back. A fellow observer. She's wrapped in a scarf and aviation goggles juggling a pen and a notebook while hanging onto the unsteady car. Oh my god. The dust scours your face and rips at your clothes. Hey, uh, can't we go any faster? We're not done with our observations. She threads one arm through the strap 
stops and makes another attempt to write, but it comes out illegible. Blast it. Get inside and take dictation, will you? You're insane! Okay. You clamber through the open back window, and she hands you pen and notebook. You scribble furiously while she dictates the finer qualities of the dust and wind assaulting the car until her voice is hoarse. That'll do. She bangs on the roof. Judith, let's go. Let's move on from here. The women who study dust storms. Why do I sense fantastic stories up this way? Despite the fact that, oh, I see one. I see one story. It's gonna be great. The twisters touch down in a cornfield, fence posts flying in its wake. The huge black stallion charges toward the tornado. On its back, a cowboy whips his lasso through the churning air, nearly matching the twister's speed. His wild laughter carries on the wind. Oh my god! Talk about tilting at windmills. God damn it, Bill! Another man hollers, clapping his hands to his hat to keep it from flying off. Quit being a damn fool! The man on the horse turns toward him and flashes a beatific grin before digging his heels harder into the horse's flanks. I got a lot of travel stories. Let's seek shelter and see what you happens You follow then. the man and his hat into a root cellar. Bill's damn good with horses, but he's only happy when he's trying to tame something bigger than himself. What does he think he's gonna do? Ride it? When the storm clears, Bill and his horse have vanished. Well, let's move on. Bill the cowboy who rode a storm. Okay, so because I didn't see it, I've, I've sort of filled in the blanks, changing the uh, substance of the story. Interesting. All right, this story had better be fucking kick-ass, having to go all the way out in the middle, piss and nowhere to hear it. How much you want to bet it sucks? No, must, must remain positive. The baby buffalo lies tangled by a fence, wire biting into its flesh. Please, it says. I must reach the sanctuary before they find me. What? The light here has a thin quality. Colors are oddly muted. There's a taste of something old in the air. Who's chasing you, little one? They were hunters of my kind. I am the last born. Every year it repeats. I must run. They must chase. It is the cycle that lets my people survive. You hear hoofbeats. A ways back down the road, a cloud of dust rises. The buffalo struggles. Please, help me. Or embrace total nihilism. Now I'll free the buffalo. The wire cuts into your hands, but you untangle the animal. The buffalo charges off as soon as it's free. Come on. You glance behind. A trio of riders emerges at the head of the dust cloud. Follow the buff! You run alongside the buffalo. Not far. It grunts. Just ahead. You see the boundary. A line of rocks that mark the border. But the hoofbeats sound close. The ground dips and the beast stumbles and falls. Carry the buffalo! On you any second. You snatch up the beast and run for the boundary line. All you can hear is the pounding hooves and the whooping of the riders. They're on you just before you reach the line. You hurl the buff forward as you fall. Look up. The buffalo crosses the line and turns with a defiant bellow. A primal sound that far outstrips its size. It drags its feet through the dirt, kicking up a cloud of dust. When it settles, 
The four are nowhere to be seen. You hear the distant clamor of a herd in motion. Move on. I did good. That being said, my poor health. I gotta get back the short way and grab my help, myself a hammy before I fucking keel over and die. I mean, dying may have its own advantages, but I would rather not figure out what they are. I don't know. I see. I see nothing good about dying. Dying. That's always a fail state, right? R right. Right. Alright. Store. Um, I'll grab a Coney dog. There we go. Alright. Uh, what can I do at the train station? Okay, I can go to other cities, but I need to have... I need to be flush. Flush with cash in order to afford that. Uh, camera, please. I do declare I'm going to follow Route 30 all the way to that... Campfire far off in the distance. Oh, you know what? Well, I'm on my way. Pop up the thumb. At least the music is fucking fantastic. Headed out of Chicago way. My, my. Who wants some jazz? Oh, well. Stuffy vultures. What are we at? She's getting married, the soldier tells you. The two of you observe the church from the dusty road, straining to hear the faint joy of the ceremony transpiring within. I fought for 10 years to come home because she said she'd be here waiting for me. And look, can you believe it? No. So what am I supposed to do? What does she expect? That I should throw myself from the nearest cliff? Walk into the ocean? He snorts, sets off down the road. I'll wait behind. You wait a while. Eventually, the bride emerges from the church alone and looks out over the cornfield when she sees you and only you her posture falls in a full body sigh she picks up the hem of her dress and goes back inside the soldier who came home to find his girl getting married that was Fucking abysmal and depressing. I loved it. Let's go into Chicago. Explore a little. Just a little. It's the midday. Oh boy. And yet this whole neighborhood is eerily quiet. Everyone seems to have retreated into their homes as if warned of something. You soon realize what? The reciprocating sound of a Thompson gun emptying its drum. Run for cover? You get behind a car, putting the engine block between you and the sound. But it's muffled, coming from inside a building. You're in no danger, you think. So you allow yourself a peek above the black hull of the car. What do I see? And running down the cobblestone street, a man in fine, blood-spattered clothes. He has his hands out. Mouth open, screaming something, but you don't catch what he says. He's drowned out by gunfire, and his body slumps to the ground. I have to keep watching. It's my job to chronicle this. The men responsible, three abreast in dark overcoats and wide hats, walk up to him to check on the body. The smallest of the three has a nervous energy about him. People are gonna see us, boss. People ain't gonna see nothing. Not on these streets. 
Moving on. The killers on the streets. I could probably use some more cash. I'll look for some work. It starts to rain in the kind of torrential tree stripping way that only happens once or twice a year. Everyone scrambles for cover, but one guy stands out in the street. A fellow with a bale of bent and lopsided umbrellas. Ten cents each, he hollers. What an opportunist! The rain has soaked him through, but he's doing a roaring trade. Hey! Go around on the main shopping streets and pick up all the umbrellas you see, okay? People sometimes drop them when they blow inside out. I'll pay you. I'm in. He's right. There are umbrellas scattered all up and down the street like fallen birds. You gather up an armful and the umbrella seller buys them off you for a couple coins. The next morning, though, your throat is hoarse and your nose is running like a faucet. Damn it! Well, can I get... Oh, I'll, I'll take a deep dish pizza. Delightful. Healthy points. It was important. What do we have? Deep in the fields, you come across a group of young men clearing weeds and sod from a roadside plot. Pitchforks flying, weeds dying. You almost don't notice that the dark lump beside them is a dozing boy lying smack dab in the middle of their work. Look closer? There's an odd frenzy to the way these boys are ripping the sod apart. When they notice you approaching, they jog over and stand silently between you and their sleeping comrade. What in the hell is going on? The youths share nervous looks. The oldest steps forward. G -g -g Get going, he blurts, leveling a pitchfork at your gut. His hands are shaking. He seems serious. Embrace total nihilism. It had to happen eventually this episode. Is your friend all right? You step closer, and the ringleader loses his nerve. He died, he blurts. He was sweating and crying, and he just fell over. They won't come get us with the truck till sundown. You realize now that the sleeper has been posed. The ashy shadow on his face wasn't cast by a tree. Ooh. The boy who died in the fields where no one could be called to collect his body. Who do we have here? Cassidy. Chapter 1. You and me. I've met a lot of people like you on this road. There's something you want from it, isn't there? Damn right. A desire that scratches and scrapes away at the sides of your body. You know more than you say. Does being out here feed that part of you? It's that way for me. Living in a state of motion, resting nowhere, returning to no one. I've been a wandering ghost for a while now, and I'll be that way for some time to come. But that's a fate I should have known I was in for. I'm a poet, after all. Oh, I see. Sometimes I want to hear a sadness that resonates with my own. Do you know any stories like that? Sad stories? I've got a few. Um, how about... <laughs> uh, how about Franklin's travels? Is that sad enough for you? Uh, let's go with the dead woman in the yellow ribbon. It's evolved, so hopefully it will uh, have an effect. The tragedy in that story, it's real. Have you ever tried writing poetry? I have. You don't want to read what I've written. I know sadness. These days, the melancholy just settles over me like a heavy bay fog. It makes its residence with me, and I accommodate it. I start to think, well, the world isn't made for being happy in, not for someone like me. My old friends have their happiness. Jess and Deborah, Pauline, Silas too, maybe. And good for them. It'd be wrong to begrudge someone their happiness, wouldn't it? No matter how jealous you are. Sometimes I want to hear a sadness that resonates with you want more you want more sadness? You want you want more sadness. Huh. He wants a tragic story. Interesting. Can I only have three stories in any given category at a time? Or does it just choose my three most powerful stories? Uh, well I'll tell the story of Mason's loss. Sounds like the saddest thing I got. Focusing on the tragic parts. That one was like getting locked out in the cold with nothing but your sorrow. I liked it. Wait, can I use all of these people's stories 
um, focusing on different bits of it. So, like, every time I learn a part of someone's story, that some, like, character story, that's like a get-out-of-jail-free card? Maybe. Maybe. Change. I've seen a lot of change. Everything. Everyone I thought I had is gone. My friend Pauline, she had a big house and a husband who often wasn't around, so naturally, that's where we went for readings. Hmm. We were wild, radiant, sweaty, alive. Doesn't sound like a poetry reading you're talking about. All kinds of people came and all of them were poets. All of them with such beautiful souls. Are you sure you're not a prostitute? Each with so many things to say and the true heart to share them. It's hard to believe that's all gone now. Do you know any stories that will make me laugh? A tall order, I know. I got a few. Story of the killer pigeons. Um, when in doubt, I got the story of the girl with the basket of kittens around Cleveland. Oh, I like that one. Very, very clever. Joy. I've had joy in my life. I used to be part of a group of mad prophets, rabble rousers, channelers of holy knowledge. We'd get a couple gallons of wine, bring them over to our friend Pauline's house. Then we'd shout these incandescent verses to each other, to the land and the sky. You see, I'm not sure if this is, this is or is not a metaphor for sex. We were loud late into the night. Right? You, you, do, you, do you see what I'm hearing here? What good would those words do if they didn't reach the heavens? Sometimes I want to hear a sadness that resonates. Jeez. Little Ben's struggle. Uh, let's not waste all those too fast. Sadness. I got ter- Oh, about the story of the white deer. That's sad, right? The tragedy in that story, it's real. If you freedom, sometimes I feel like I don't know how to use it. When I consider my situation in the mornings, I mean, soberly, I know there's no way to bring things back to the way they were. I think I'll just find my own path. Surely that's what's meant to happen now that I'm no longer bound to anyone. But how can I? That group was everything I knew. I was cast adrift by what happened, and I can't come to rest. Sometimes I want to hear a sadness you and your sadness. Oh, I gotta tell Oh, finally! Finally, the tale of John Chapman, his orchard, and his dog. That one was like getting locked out in the cold with nothing but heaven. We look for it in other people. We all want someone to fill the absence in our lives. You're preaching to the choir, pal. I would say perhaps that's a lost cause. Oh, ice cold. I search for someone out there, some kind of connection, someone to complete me. Well, I mean, you gotta be complete yourself, then you can find someone. Silas said, you've become too attached to the idea that someone can complete you. Try letting go. Sounds like a wise person. So, this is me, trying to let go. You might have, you might have let go a little too hard, man. I miss the old group. I really do. I still have that image in my head. Pauline's house, the poets, Jess, me. But on top of them all, there's Silas. In my memory, he looms, he haunts. You ever meet someone so far above everyone else? It's like they were from a different plane altogether. Yes. That was him. A divine presence among normal human beings. Silas was part of the group, but at the same time, he wasn't. He was better than any of us. Wiser, gentler, stronger. We all held him in respect. We were in awe of his power as a writer, in reverence for the beauty of his soul. I still love him. Look, I'm headed out this way. If you find yourself out there, maybe we'll meet again. Hmm, I'll keep my eyes open for you. That looks like it might be in my path, though maybe I should shunt north. Maybe. Cassidy, eh? I do believe I can even see his, uh his uh his fire on the horizon all right that'll do for this episode of let's play where the water tastes like wine uh good night everyone